All right, so uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Barbara Engelhardt from Princeton. Uh, Barbara did her PhD uh, at UC Berkeley in computer science with Mike Jordan, and then she did a postdoc with Matthew Stevens. And uh, she's been doing uh, a broad range of work uh, looking at uh, statistical models for high dimensional genomic data. And uh, she'll tell us more about it. Thanks. Okay, so. Uh, this is basically the exact same slide deck that I used yesterday, but now we're going to talk about the portion of it that's actually my research. So uh, just to uh, orient you uh, to what we're talking about today, and actually it's going to be uh, sort of uh, the ideas transposed in some sense. So today uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that uh, my group has been doing on uh, looking at uh, uh, latent uh, patterns, uh, hidden, hidden structure in uh, uh, gene expression data. Okay, so if you remember uh, sort of this, uh, this framework that we're thinking about, uh, uh, these Bayesian latent factor models. Uh, so over here, let's see, oh yeah. Here we have uh, uh, our matrix Y, which in this case now we're going to, like I said, transpose it so that uh, along the rows now, we're gonna have uh, the set of genes, and along the columns, we're gonna have the set of individuals, okay? Uh, so in this case, uh, just like we had yesterday, the number of genes is often way higher than the number of individuals, and the patterns that we're looking for are generally going to be among the genes, not the individuals. We're going to assume the individuals or the samples or, or IID uh, from some distribution. Uh, and we're going to decompose this matrix uh, into two separate matrices, uh, lambda and x. Uh, lambda is going to be, in this case, p, the number of genes by k. x is going to be uh, k by n. Uh, and we're going to have sparsity uh, in lambda, although we're gonna, I'm going to talk to you about how we actually do that later on. Um, and so we're going to call these lambda, uh, this lambda matrix uh, the loadings, and we're going to call this X matrix the factors. Uh, and in general now we can describe each, uh, of, uh, each element of Y, uh, so this is going to be a single gene expression uh, data point for individual I at gene J. In terms of a Gaussian distribution, where the mean again is going to be the inner product of uh, lambda and X corresponding to that individual and that gene. Uh, and the variance is going to be some, uh, uh, some variable that is uh, shared across the genes, or sorry, that is different, unique to each gene. This is isotropic noise, so uh, we don't have a full covariance matrix. It's, they're going to be independent, okay? Any questions about this? So this is, we're going to stick with this setup basically for the rest of the, the, the talk. Okay. So uh, as we talked about yesterday, we went through uh, principal components analysis, admixture models, uh, non-negative matrix factorization, and different uh, types of changes that we could do uh, to these models in order to uh, estimate uh, uh, gene, uh, sorry, genetic uh, uh, structure, latent population structure, and genetic data. So now I'm going to skip way ahead uh, past all of the things we talked about yesterday and get to new stuff. Okay. So, uh, uh, so yeah, so now the framework that we're talking about today, again, where Y is now going to be uh, P genes by N samples. Uh, and if we think about the interpretation of the latent factors and, and the loadings, the corresponding loadings then, uh, they often uh, represent uh, all the components of uh, latent variation, or, or of the variation in, in the gene expression levels. For, so for example, if you actually pull out uh, some of these X variables, you might find population structure, age, sex, technical effects uh, batch, uh, a, a lot of these different uh, covariates that we know contribute to uh, changes, uh, variance in gene expression levels, which is modeled by the lambda, okay? Uh, so, so in particular, yeah, we find uh, correlation with uh, covariates batch and library prep. We find correlation with biological covariates, so tissue heterogeneity, age, sex, BMI. Uh, we find uh, population structure, this is all in X, uh, sample ancestry, for example. Uh, but one thing that uh, we're interested in exploring carefully is uh, the idea that we could have genomic covariates. So these are going to be uh, in this X, these are going to be uh, 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 the genotype effectively of uh, a set of individuals that regulate some uh, small number of genes. Okay, so this is why we want to induce sparsity in lambda, is because uh, it may be the case that uh, this uh, genotype that's going to be represented in X actually is, uh, is regulating a very small subset of genes, so we want a lot of zeros uh, in the loadings, possibly, okay? Another issue that comes up here is that uh, if you remember my caveats, my warnings from yesterday about sort of over-interpreting the latent variables, uh, I would again reiterate that today. So uh, when we're talking about, for example, batch effects, there's not going to be a single factor in here that represents batch effects generally, uh, because batch effects tend to affect a lot of genes, 
Uh, and so we have the problems with rotational invariance uh, when we pull out batch effects. So in general, we find that uh, there are going to be number, multiple factors uh, that correspond to batch effects and maybe uh, correlated with uh, other technical covariates as well. Okay. All right, so uh, let's motivate this, and I promise we're going to bring uh, this whole story full circle uh, at the end of uh, uh, this talk uh, by thinking about uh, sort of gene-gene interactions here, okay? So uh, when we think about a co-expression matrix, which looks like a terrible hairball generally, a a as you've seen, um, uh, we can think about uh, small groups of genes, like here's a set of three genes here, these purple ones, uh, and they're sort of uh, represented by this very sparse matrix here uh, in, this, in this particular uh, column. And the black here in this matrix denotes uh, non-zero values, and the white denotes zero values. And the idea is that we would really like to be able to pull out these connected components uh, in, uh, in this uh, uh, matrix lambda. Uh, and in particular, we would like to try and, and see if we can interpret these latent components in terms of, for example, a specific genetic effect. So in other words, these three genes are all co-regulated by the same expression QTL or EQTL. We, you guys have talked about expression QTLs already? Okay, great. Um, the, the caveat is that the more sparsity we have uh, in this lambda matrix, uh, the more factors we're going to need to represent all the sources of variation. So in other words, the K, we, yesterday we were thinking about this as, as dimension reduction, where our K, our number of factors, was uh, really small, uh, thinking about population structure. But in this case, because we're th throwing so much sparsity in there, and because there's so many sort of uh, separate sources of variation, we actually want to make K fairly big. This is called an overcomplete basis. Uh, and, uh, and we're interested in exploring that as well. But uh, the uh, obvious caveat to that is that uh, in order to do that, we need a huge amount of uh, sort of statistical structure on top of these matrices in order to be able to elicit uh, this, this overcomplete basis in a robust and, and identifiable way. Okay, so uh, the way we actually do this in practice is by having three layers of sparsity, which sounds a little bit like overkill, but I'll motivate why we do it. So uh, we actually regularize this lambda, uh, the loadings matrix, globally, factor-wise, and locally, okay? So the reason we do that, well, let me, let me just say that we use this uh, uh, distribution called a three-parameter beta. I think I have a, a description of what that looks like. No, I do not. A three-parameter beta is basically just a beta distribution uh, with an extra parameter that allows you to uh, uh, change the variance term, okay? So uh, it actually, this, this looks uh, pretty messy, but actually you can rewrite it uh, as, um, no, I never have it rewritten. You can actually rewrite the three-parameter beta as uh, two gamma distributions, uh, one of which parameterizes the variance term of the next one. Uh, so actually, if you write this out, there's going to be six gamma distributions here uh, with intermediate variables. Uh, but this is the, uh, the, the alternative form of it, uh, the marginalized form of it, uh, marginalizing over those intermediate variables. Um, and uh, th this introduces nice sparsity. In fact, you can parameterize it so it looks exactly like what's called a horseshoe prior. Uh, so the horseshoe prior, if we go all the way down to this lambda, right? So remember, the lambda is going to be uh, one, of, uh, one of the elements of this uh, loadings matrix, okay? So I, the i kth I -th lambda uh, is going to be drawn from a normal distribution with mean zero, okay? So you can imagine uh, these being centered at zero, right? In, in general, we want them to be small. Uh, and then we're going to regularize this by uh, one over psi here, minus one. And the idea is that if we, we shrink this according to this three parameter beta, you can imagine when this is close to one, uh, that this value, this uh, variance term uh, goes down to zero, basically, okay? And so in other words, you can imagine this degenerate Gaussian distribution, basically a point mass right at zero. Uh, and so that's gonna shrink these lambda terms pretty heavily, okay? You can imagine when uh, this term is uh, closer to zero, uh, that actually this term uh, blows up to something very, very large. So now we have a very large variance term on here, and the lambdas are allowed to uh, uh, be large, possibly. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so this is a, a way of uh, introducing uh, heavy sparsity on lambda. And the reason we do three layers of it is the following. So uh, the, the top layer here, actually I can explain it. The top layer here uh, basically shrinks every element uh, of this matrix to zero as, as much as possible, okay? And the reason we want to do that is that it actually allows us to uh, uh, have this sort of non-parametric behavior where actually the, the number of K elements in this matrix, or so the number of K factors in this matrix is driven by the data. 
So we're shrinking so heavily that actually some of these columns uh, end up being zero uh, because we're sh shrinking so hard globally. Uh, we do a factor-specific layer, which allows each uh, of the factor loadings uh, to have a different level of sparsity. Okay? So again, uh, there's not going to be a single uh, hyperparameter on sparsity. Uh, the sparsity is uh, uh, drawn from uh, uh, this uh, three-parameter beta distribution as well. And the reason we do the local layer, the element-wise layer, is because within each of those columns, uh, we would really like to have a lot of zeros. Okay, so if we uh, only left it at the top two layers, global and factor specific, then we would actually have dense uh, factors everywhere. We would not have element-wise sparsity, but we would remove uh, some number k uh, of those factors. Okay, is that, is that clear? Or some factors would be all zero. They would either be all zero or all dense. Yeah. Uh, the global layer? Okay, yeah. Let me, uh, let me go back to the actual distribution. So, uh, so we actually have a single, a single parameter here which is drawn from a three-parameter beta. Okay? So this is going to be our global sparsity. So in other words, we're basically uh, taking uh, all of the elements of this matrix and forcing them to be uh, as small as this parameter chooses them to be. Okay? So we're just estimating that parameter from the data. Uh, for every single column K, in this matrix, we're going to do the same thing, where we're going to try and shrink the values as much as possible using this three-parameter beta prior again. Uh, and then within each column, uh, for, for each ith element, we're going to do the exact same thing, where we try and shrink each element uh, of that column as much as possible according to the uh, uh, sparsity-inducing prior from the, the factor level. Does that make sense? OK, yeah. So, so we end up getting this uh, fairly nice behavior. Uh, of uh, non-parametric and also uh, uh, sparsity that can vary widely uh, across the different uh, uh, factors here, or factor loadings. Um, so the problem is that when we actually think about uh, gene expression data, some of these factors are actually not sparse, in fact, right? So population structure, batch effects tend to uh, impact the expression level of pretty much all the genes. Uh, and if we're going to have this much sparsity uh, in, in our prior, it actually uh, behooves us to do something slightly different. So, uh, so what we actually do is have a, a two-component mixture uh, for these local variables here, where either we draw the parameter just like before uh, from a, a three-parameter beta with probability pi. With probability one minus pi, we actually just regularize according to the factor-specific parameter. Okay? And so the idea is that if we uh, are in this component of the mixture, uh, we're going to regularize, uh, we're going to have element-wise sparsity in, in each of the vectors, or in that particular vector, in the case vector. Uh, and if we uh, choose this component uh, of the mixture model, we're going to have dense, uh, uh, dense component, uh, dense, yeah, a dense, a dense uh, loading. So we're going to have non-zero values in that, uh, in that component. Is that clear? So, <laughs> or not. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so we just uh, have the indicator variable z for whether you're going to be sparse or dense uh, according to this conjugate uh, beta Bernoulli distribution. Questions? This is a lot of uh, details that <laughs> you may or may not be interested in, but uh, slow, slow me down if you, uh, you want to discuss any of these. Yeah. Is the y matrix drawn from the distribution, and does it matter that distribution? The y matrix? Ah, good point. So actually, we're going to get to the, the gene networks. Uh, I mean, it's drawn from a Gaussian. So we're going to make the assumption that it's Gaussian. It may, in fact, be overdispersed or something like that. So, um, uh, or non Gaussian, or I mean, heavy tailed or something like that. Uh, not overdispersed, but heavy tailed. And um, uh, does it make a difference? Well, in terms of, in terms of networks, I'm actually going to bring it back to uh, the networks using lambda uh, in a few slides. But uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying about the binary uh, relationship. Yeah. Okay, it's just a, a, a latent indicator variable for whether each of these k, the, each of the uh, k components uh, in this matrix uh, are going to be sparse or dense. It's uh, it's hidden. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's look at some results when we apply this to gene expression data. So um, uh, we call this SFA mix. Uh, because of the mixture component. So here we have our known covariates. And, let's, and what we did here was we plotted uh, the correlation of the gene expression levels from the dense factors that we identified in this gene expression matrix uh, with the known covariates. 
And unsurprisingly and happily, we see uh, a lot of uh, uh, correlation with uh, the components that are known to contribute a huge amount to the variance of gene expression levels. So for example, here we see that uh, uh, factor 18 and uh, 27, or whatever numbers those are, are uh, well correlated with exposure uh, batch. Uh, and similarly, we see, we see a few that uh, look to be partially correlated with gender um, and age also uh, over here. Uh, so again, the good news is that we are actually finding uh, uh, things in this data set, uh, in this uh, latent, latent patterns that we know correspond to true confounding effects, true, true contributors to variants uh, in the gene expression data. Okay? And uh, again, I want to reiterate that uh, because of this uh, uh, possibility that the factors can be correlated and uh, because of the possibility that we can split uh, the sort of interpretation of each of these factors across uh, different covariates. Uh, it means we can't interpret any of these individually, but we can look at them globally and see that we do recover a lot of this uh, uh, signal uh, from these effects. Okay? And these are dense, so as I was saying yesterday, uh, they are uh, uh, invariant to rotation. So we could rotate these and we'll get the exact same likelihood. Okay. Uh, so here's what we can do uh, uh, with the very, very sparse components. So uh, as I motivated before, we were interested in looking to see whether uh, the small subsets of uh, gene, uh, gene expression levels that are, that are identified in the, uh, uh, in the very sparse factors are actually driven by genetic effects. Okay? And we're doing this in an entirely unsupervised way in the sense that we're just looking for the, the co-expression patterns among genes uh, that we pull out of the, the gene expression matrix. We could think about uh, another way to do this, which is actually drive the, the selection of those subsets of genes by uh, the genetic markers, but um, I'll get to that later. Uh, so in this unsupervised sense, we take these uh, latent components that we recover, uh, and we just do uh, association mapping. So uh, here we have, uh, sorry, on the y-axis we have the univariate uh, uh, log 10 base factor, uh, which basically just measures association between uh, a particular SNP. Uh, and all of the genes in uh, that, uh, that component. Uh, and on the x-axis, we have the uh, log 10 base factor of uh, that same SNP with um, the, the collection of genes, the actual factor that we pulled out uh, from the uh, latent factor model. And, and you can see here we've colored the, the uh, cis associations red and the trans associations blue. Uh, and you can see that we have substantially more power uh, when using the latent factors and doing association mapping uh, for finding both cis and trans EQTLs. Uh, this kind of surprised us actually. For, for cis, I wasn't imagining that we would see that much enrichment, but we certainly do. Uh, for trans, we also get a, a pretty nice enrichment uh, of, the, uh, of the associations that we find as well. Uh, and presumably we're finding, uh, for the ones that we don't uh, get a, a nice enrichment of, these are going to be the ones, uh, the, the sets of genes that actually aren't uh, pulled out uh, as factors. Okay. Okay, so uh, I promise we come back to gene ex uh, co-expression networks, and uh, let's talk about them uh, at, at this point. So uh, gene co-expression networks, uh, as we all know, are incredibly important in terms of understanding uh, relationships in, uh, in a cell. Uh, so for example, uh, they allow us to understand the regulatory relationships among genes. Uh, they allow us to study gene modules, components of genes, or, or sets of genes, as opposed to single genes, if we're thinking about biomarkers, for example. Uh, they allow us to predict the effect of changes to gene expression levels uh, if we target drugs, for example, uh, toward these genes, or if we uh, find particular genes are associated with disease. So uh, these are just examples of uh, uh, gene co-expression networks that we found in the GTEx data. Uh, another type of network that uh, has been uh, proved very useful is uh, these differential gene co-expression networks. So uh, here's an example of a, a gene co-expression network uh, that's differential across males and females. Actually. Uh, it, quite honestly, these labels are switched. These are the females and these are the males. Um, but in all of these genes, they're plotted on the uh, x-axis here, you can see that across males and females, there's pretty clear differential gene expression levels between the entire set of genes in this network um, across males and females. Um, and, and these networks can be very useful in terms of thinking about comparing gene modules across two or more conditions, uh, thinking about gene modules that are predictive of pathological conditions. Uh, so, for example, in, in tumor samples or thinking about uh, sexually dimorphic traits, we might want to look at these, uh, uh, these differential networks. So there's a third kind of network that I've been particularly interested in recently, um, and we're calling them context-specific gene co-expression networks. 
So here's a female specific and here's a male specific network. Uh, and the idea is that each of the interactions within this network are going to be specific to that context. In this case, specific to female samples, specific to male samples over here. Uh, so in other words, uh, what we see is that, um, well, I'll show you the data uh, later on, but we see that these genes are actually not often uh, differentially expressed across males and females in this case, but in fact that the correlation is just not observed uh, in, the, in the opposite condition. Uh, so context-specific gene co-expression networks are, are really interesting and, and have this sort of unique uh, flavor to them in terms of interpretation. They allow us to capture context-specific gene interactions. So again, these are gene interactions that do not happen outside of that particular context. Uh, we can think about context in terms of many things, for example, sex or tissue or exposure or disease status, uh, and, and I'm going to show you examples of uh, some of those later on. Uh, we argue that, again, these are going to be uniquely informative type of uh, networks. They really allow us to understand uh, interactions that don't have parallels outside of that context, that are unique to that context. Uh, they allow us to target gene interactions only in one context. So if we find uh, for a particular female-specific network uh, that there's going to be an interaction between gene A and gene B, we would like to do something, target gene B uh, for, for a sexually dimorphic trait, for maybe a, a, a disease risk, uh, we can think about doing that via gene A, for example. Um, they also allow us to study context-specific regulatory complexes. Uh, so we're going to see a lot of examples of this when we look at uh, the tissue-specific networks. Okay, so how do we actually do this? Um, so I showed you the model uh, uh, from uh, the, sorry, the, the, the latent factor model that we had before with sparsity on lambda. Okay, so if you remember, uh, before we have our genes and our samples, uh, we're going to decompose it into uh, the number of genes by K and the number of K by samples. And the way that we're going to um, do the, the way that we're actually going to elicit these, uh, these three different types of networks from something that looks like this is by putting sparsity in X. Okay, so we have the exact same uh, three layer, three parameter beta sparsity uh, on the X matrix as well now. Okay? Um, and we also have the mixture model on both of them, so we have both sparse and dense. Uh, possibilities for uh, lambda and x. Okay. Um, yeah, in general, we're going to set the uh, number of components k to be small. In reality, we actually set it to be sort of three times n. Uh, so it ends up being fairly large. I say small, but that's not true. Remember, we're looking for an overcomplete basis here. We want to pull out as many factors as we possibly can. Okay, so uh, how do you actually recover the bi-clusters from the latent structure? So if you think about uh, you know, component number eight, for example, in this matrix, right? You see uh, some subset of non-zero genes, and you see some subset of non-zero samples. Uh, and now the idea is that if you actually think about uh, the uh, uh, outer product of these genes and these samples, you're actually going to get uh, a matrix that is uh, non-zero for the subset of samples, uh, only for the subset of genes. Okay, so if these are, for example, uh, liver tissue samples, uh, and there are zeros for all the other types of tissues, uh, these are going to be a set of genes that, for some reason, are co-expressed only in that subset of samples. So this is going to be our interpretation as a bi-cluster. Okay, so we're clustering not only the features uh, uh, in the genes, but also the, uh, 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 the samples uh, in X. Okay? Okay, so here are those actual outer products that I was referring to. So again, if you look at uh, a particular uh, outer product of the uh, uh, loading and the uh, factor, you can see that there's only going to be a subset of non-zero values in there. And again, that's going to be representative of your bi-cluster here. Okay? Any questions about that? So if you think about the sum across all of these, uh, then you can sort of think of it as a patchwork uh, describing uh, the, the variance components of Y. Um, so we're going to rewrite this matrix, yeah, uh, I already said that, sorry. Uh, the variation may affect a subset of genes or all, and the variation also may be found in a subset of samples or all. So because we have this mixture component uh, on, on our factors, then uh, some of these will be dense and some of these will be sparse. And so uh, the subsetting might not be a subset uh, at all in either dimension. Okay, so the way we actually go from uh, these uh, sparse factor models to uh, a gene network uh, goes like this. So if you integrate over uh, uh, the uh, factors, the uh, factors X, uh, then you actually get an estimate of the P by P covariance matrix for Y. So this is going to be a gene by gene covariance matrix, uh, and it's going to be described in terms of these low dimensional matrices, uh, lambda, lambda transpose, uh, plus uh, our, our sigma variance. Um, actually, I'm, I'm leaving out a term to be very technical here. Uh, I'm leaving out uh, a covariance term uh, uh, for X 
uh, in between lambda and lambda transpose. But uh, for just ease of discussion, let's, uh, let's look at it like this. Uh, so this, again, is going to be uh, something that we're going to call omega, which is going to be our, our gene by gene covariance matrix. So if you think about what this means, right, it means that using this latent factor model, we can get uh, an estimate of the covariance matrix in a very low dimension. So this is going to be a highly regularized uh, covariance matrix, uh, P by P covariance matrix, OK? OK, so uh, uh, for those of you who know about uh, 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 what we're going to do now is basically use that covariance matrix to construct something called a Gaussian graphical model or a Gaussian field. So if we take that regularized estimate of the covariance, right, we can invert it. Uh, we're going to get uh, a precision matrix. Uh, and the idea behind a precision matrix, which is, again, the inverse uh, of the uh, covariance matrix that we have estimated, uh, is that uh, the individual elements of uh, this precision matrix, if we normalize them uh, appropriately, uh, are going to correspond to something called the partial correlation. So uh, if, if uh, this is the, the covariance, this is going to be the partial correlation, where partial correlation represents uh, the correlation between any pair of genes A and B, uh, controlling for the uh, effects of all other genes. Okay? So in other words, if we think about a relationship between a pair of genes A and B, if that relationship is mediated by gene C, then the partial correlation will be near zero. Uh, but, it, but if, in fact, they are co-regulated together, uh, I interacting, uh, then the partial correlation will be non-zero, somewhere between uh, 1 and negative 1. Okay. Uh, so what we can do is take that uh, psi matrix that we have, the precision matrix, uh, or the partial correlation matrix, and threshold that according to some uh, false discovery rate metric. Uh, and we can basically think about now uh, all the zeros and the ones uh, in this uh, thresholded psi matrix. Uh, and uh, we can actually just use those zeros and ones to draw out uh, a network. Okay. So remember that partial correlation, uh, in this case, when, it is, uh, uh, when it's thresholded to 1, uh, is going to represent a direct relationship between, any, uh, between a pair of genes controlling for everything else, which implies that there's going to be an edge between any pair of genes where there's a 1 in this network. It's going to be a symmetric network. Does that make sense? Any questions? OK. Uh, so uh, that's how we can make a, uh, a, a global network. We have our regularized covariance matrix. And the way that we can think about uh, context-specific networks from bi-clusters is as follows. So uh, let's actually reconstruct uh, our covariance matrix uh, from a subset of the clusters. So in particular, let's choose the loadings, uh, in this case lambda 8, that only correspond to non-zero values in a particular context. So these are going to be the ones where the corresponding x vectors uh, are not um, are non-zero for, for example, liver or females. Okay, so we're going to reconstruct this matrix uh, using um, uh, uh, using a subset of the uh, of the uh, uh, factor loadings, and now we can have a uh, a context-specific uh, correlation matrix. Okay. Uh, we're going to do the exact same thing we did before, which is take this context-specific correlation matrix, invert it to get our precision matrix, uh, threshold this according to uh, uh, an FDR cutoff. And I should, I should say, uh, for those of you paying attention, uh, this is actually going to be a bit of a disaster if we invert uh, this very sparse matrix. It actually ends up being a very dense matrix uh, uh, if there's a, a not nice uh, subsetting here. Uh, so actually what we do is at this point, uh, at this point at the correlation matrix, we uh, basically remove all of the genes uh, that uh, are zero uh, in that matrix. And then we can invert. Uh, so like before, we, we, we threshold this, uh, and we can pull out now a context-specific network. So again, these are going to be uh, gene pairs where the correlation, the partial correlation, in fact, uh, is, is not explained uh, by any other genes and where this partial correlation is only observed in this particular subset of samples. OK? Any questions? You guys are even quieter today. OK, so differential networks, you can, you can actually uh, uh, get those the exact same way as, as these context-specific networks, where we're going to select components uh, that have differential factors of, factor values. So what we find is that there's going to be a number of, of factors where, for example, males are, uh, ha have very high uh, values of the factor, and females have very low values of the factor. So we can just do a, a Wilcoxon test uh, uh, for any of the contexts that we care about and uh, use uh, the, those factors that uh, come up as uh, significant 
across two specific conditions uh, to build these uh, psi matrices uh, for differential networks. Okay. All right, so uh, now I would like to introduce uh, the data set that we're, we're looking at. Um, so uh, I'm part of the uh, GTEx consortium, the Genotype Tissue Expression data set. Uh, so in the current release, which is V6, we have 552 individuals. Actually, in terms of genotyping, we have 449 individuals. We have uh, over 7,000 samples, uh, which is quite impressive. Uh, we have 60% males, 40% uh, females in our data set in terms of the, sample, in terms of the samples. Uh, and so the reason that there's so many more samples than individuals is that for every uh, individual, we actually take on average 18 uh, different uh, uh, tissue types. Uh, and you can see that we have a total of 44 different tissue types uh, in the current data set where we have more than um, 50 samples, I think, or no, more than 40 samples. Uh, so, so we're actually going to look at uh, the uh, tissue specificity uh, of, of networks uh, in, uh, across these tissues. So I'll show you the easy stuff first. Okay, so the first thing we did was actually pull out uh, sex differential gene co-expression networks. So in other words, these are going to be uh, interactions that are differential across males and females. That looks pretty uh, wiped out, but uh, there's very clear uh, differential expression across male and females of this subset of genes. Uh, if you look at what some of these genes mean, uh, they are very, very involved in uh, sex differentiation. So a lot of these are uh, uh, X or Y chromosome uh, genes. And uh, they basically describe exactly the set of genes that are differentially expressed in males and females, as we see here over here. So uh, this is incredibly easy to interpret. Uh, this sort of gives us some calibration that we're kind of probably doing the right thing. Uh, and um, uh, the differential uh, expression levels tell us that, again, uh, uh, allow us to interpret these as uh, genes that are differentially expressed across males and females. So that's easy. Um, the harder ones are actually the context-specific networks. Uh, they're incredibly difficult to understand. So this is a female-only gene co-expression network. Uh, and there is one gene here, uh, estrogen receptor 1, whoops, down here, uh, that is uh, differentially expressed in males and females, and a known, uh, a known uh, gene involved in uh, sexually dimorphic traits. So this is about uh, sex uh, ho steroid hormone metabolism. Uh, the other genes that we find in this network and the relationships among genes in this network uh, are absolutely not clear in terms of their role uh, in, in uh, female-specific processes. Uh, so there's a few that have um, relationships to, for example, breast cancer risk, uh, and that's probably because, uh, well, actually, I'm not even going to uh, try and pretend I know why that is. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, PDRG1 gene, um, I had someone come up to me after a, a talk and say that they just found that uh, it is involved in the regulation of multiple sclerosis, which is uh, a sexually dimorphic disease. Uh, and, and so we're following up on a, on a couple of these uh, uh, genes and the gene interactions, thinking about uh, their actual role in, in possibly in sexually dimorphic diseases. But in general, uh, this is harder to interpret because these are not canonically sex differential genes. In other words, they could be uh, equivalently expressed across males and females. Uh, but again, the, the context-specific networks pull out uh, interactions, co uh, correlation that is not observed uh, outside, of this, uh, outside of this context, in this case, outside of females. So, so I think the interpretation biologically is going to be a little bit more difficult. Uh, we can say the exact same thing about uh, male-only gene co-expression networks, where uh, we see uh, one gene that is known to be differentially expressed in males and females, uh, this huge one right here. And in fact, it, it, it's known to be differentially expressed because it's, I think, basically only expressed in, in prostate. And you can imagine that, uh, obviously, women do not have prostate, so uh, uh, it basically doesn't show up in women at all. Um, the other ones, uh, I'm, I'm really reaching here again to, to find these interpretations, and this took me forever to, to try and uh, look up uh, what these genes represent, but um, in general, again, they're not going to be canonically sex differential genes. These are going to be uh, genes that have other interpretations uh, that, that we need to figure out what they are biologically. Okay, so if we look then at, um, for example, uh, a, a tissue that is only observed in a single sex, so in this case we can look at uh, vagina samples. Uh, we can pull out the, uh, the, the network that's specific to these samples, uh, and as before, uh, we see two genes that um, are, are, are sex differentiation, are involved in sex differentiation, uh, so the androgen receptor and estrogen receptor 1. Uh, but as before, the rest of the genes in this network uh, really don't have any uh, uh, obvious sex differential role. Uh, 
Uh, the interesting thing that comes up when we look at uh, this network actually is that a lot of these, or a few of these genes are related to uh, uh, things like uterine cancers, bladder uh, extrophy, and uh, we, we were, I, I was puzzling about that for a while, but here's what I think is happening there, and, and we see this for uh, other uh, tissue-specific networks as well, like skin, uh, for example, skin and lung, uh, where we see a lot of genes involved in lung cancer or skin cancer, uh, uh, precancerous cells. Uh, and what I think is going on there is that um, uh, when we think about subsetting this network, again, we're doing this in an entirely unsupervised way. We're not saying pull out the covariation that is observed among, uh, uh, among liver, uh, but instead we're saying uh, uh, pull out the covariation that is non-zero uh, only in liver samples. So it could be that there's a very small subset of those liver samples that are actually non-zero. Uh, so in other words, if we're thinking about Skin is the, is the obvious one for me. Uh, when we think about doing this in skin, we could have a subset of our samples that are actually precancerous, uh, that, that show markers for, for precancerous uh, uh, genes. And in that case, we're going to pull out uh, co-expression networks that actually are specific to precancerous cells, not just skin generally, okay? So, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, this whole process could very much be facilitated if we do it instead of this unsupervised way, if we do it in a supervised way. Uh, and that's sort of uh, one of the main caveats, I think, of uh, the, the bi-clustering approach where, again, it's entirely unsupervised. Okay, so uh, I'll tell you that we're doing this, but we haven't actually finished it yet. So, uh, so the question is, how do we actually, I, 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 we talked about this a bunch yesterday, but uh, how we actually validate uh, these networks. Uh, and so th again, the problem with thinking about patterns in data, uh, with thinking about uh, exploratory data analysis is that it's incredibly difficult to validate or reproduce uh, uh, the patterns that you find. But actually, the nice thing about uh, the networks that we're pulling out is that we can think of, we have a very nice uh, way to validate them by thinking about uh, conditioning on, on EQTLs. Uh, so the way that we do that is we take uh, the, the top EQTL for as many of these genes that uh, are actually regulated by a SysEQTL. So if this is a SysEQTL that regulates this gene, uh, then we test for association only with the neighbors uh, of that gene in this network, okay? So in other words, if this is a, a, a skin tissue, then only in the skin tissue samples, we test for association of this SysEQTL uh, with only the neighbors in that network, okay? Um, this, uh, if you think about it in terms of the number uh, of tests that we're actually running, if we actually tested uh, a single SNP with uh, all the genes uh, in any, all the, all the genes in that particular sample, like skin, uh, there's gonna be a huge uh, multiple hypothesis testing burden. Uh, and in general, uh, because I'm writing this paper right now, I can tell you we find basically nothing. Uh, across all the different tissues, if you do these trans association mapping, uh, you end up finding on the order of uh, 82 uh, trans EQTLs after correcting for hypothesis testing. Uh, when we do it with, uh, uh, with a subset of the data, because like I said, we haven't done the entire uh, 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 subsetting for these networks yet, but when we do it like this, uh, when we do the uh, trans EQTL testing uh, uh, using these networks, we are cutting the number of tests that we do uh, by many, many, many orders of magnitude, okay? So now, again, in skin, we're only gonna test a very, very small subset of SysEQTLs, right? Only the, SysEQ, only the SNPs that are, uh, that are regulatory in this network. And we're only gonna test them with the handful of genes that happen to be the neighbors. Um, so we're reducing the number of tests, again, in skin by something like four or five orders of magnitude, uh, maybe even more, actually, if I, if I do the math properly. Uh, and this allows us to uh, actually find some trans EQTLs that we couldn't find uh, otherwise. So, so like, I, like I said, we, we did this experiment um, for uh, four skin, uh, sorry, four uh, different tissue types in the pilot study data and found for FDR 20, uh, we found approximately uh, 30, uh, 30 E genes or genes that look like they had trans signals uh, using this type of subsetting, which is really phenomenal considering the small number of tests that we're doing. Uh, then each of these associations are going to validate each of these edges, right? Because we again see that there is actually going to be a relationship uh, among the uh, cis target and the trans gene. Uh, so, so they allow us to validate these edges. Okay? Questions? All right. Okay, so uh, in the last, uh, I don't know how much time I have, 20, 20 minutes, I'll probably end early uh, because you guys have heard a lot from me. 
uh, we're going to talk about uh, canonical correlation analysis. So this is a, a paper that's in press right now at JMLR. And I just wanted to uh, think about uh, the possible benefits of using canonical correlation analysis. So, uh, uh, so here what we have is basically uh, a two matrices. We're calling them two observations, Y1 and Y2. Uh, and there's going to be P1 uh, features uh, for Y1 and P2 features for Y2. Uh, they're going to be on the exact same set of samples, so n is the same for y1 and y2. Okay, so this might, for example, be uh, y1 uh, might, for example, be genotypes for a set of individuals, uh, and y2 might be the corresponding gene expression levels for the same set of individuals. Okay? So what we do in canonical correlation analysis is we decompose uh, each of these uh, uh, observations into uh, uh, two different lambda matrices, so this is again a P by K matrix, or P1 by K matrix here, P2 by K matrix here, uh, and a set of uh, factors X. Uh, and then we have I isotropic Gaussian noise. Uh, so the thing that we uh, are interested in here is that these X, the factors, are actually going to be shared across the two observations. Okay? So in other words, what we're doing is we're projecting uh, Y1 and Y2 down to this common uh, linear subspace, X, okay? And we're projecting them individually, uh, and that individual projection is going to be represented by the two lambda matrices, okay? So then what we can do is actually go back and interpret what those Xs mean, what that latent subspace means. So this is, in some sense, a way to recover uh, shared latent space. So if indeed these are uh, gene expression level or genotype and gene expression levels, we can now go back to the, uh, uh, the uh, lambda variables, and uh, when it's sparse, we can see that there's going to be, for example, a subset of SNPs uh, represented by uh, a specific factor in lambda 1 that regulates, that is associated with a subset of genes. Okay? So that's how we can interpret uh, canonical correlation analysis. So, uh, you know, we, we, the, way I, the way I generally think about it, and we were talking about this yesterday uh, among a subset of us, is um, that this is. Uh, this projection to this uh, shared latent subspace allows you to do supervision uh, of this dimensionality reduction. In other words, you have Y1, and we're very interested in thinking about uh, variation in Y1, but we want to actually pull out the variation that maximizes uh, the correlation between that variation, or, uh, between Y1 and Y2, okay? So in other words, we basically let the, the dimension reduction uh, for each of these different matrices be driven by uh, variation in the, in the other matrix. Uh, and I should say that the reason we have uh, such extreme sparsity, again, on lambda 1 and lambda 2, and in fact, uh, we actually practically use uh, the exact same three-parameter beta, uh, three parameter beta uh, prior that we had for uh, the, the factor analysis model that I told you about. Uh, what this allows us to do is also actually um, uh, zero out some of these columns in lambda 2. So in other words, uh, we actually represent in X, in the shared latent subspace, if, if lambda 2 is entirely zeroed out, then that latent component is going to represent a variance structure that's only identified in Y1, okay? So in other words, if we do this with gene, uh, genotypes and gene expression levels, then uh, the, we actually pull out very nicely the latent population structure and genotypes from Y1, okay? And we actually pull out uh, the same uh, gene networks that are in Y2, batch effects, for example, uh, 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 that are observed in Y2, uh, but there's no relationship between the population structure in Y1 and batch effects in Y2 in the opposite observation. Uh, so, that's, uh, so that's something really nice that you find. So in other words, we, we, in X, we model three different types of structure. We model shared structure, right, uh, where you have genes and genotypes uh, uh, being correlated, and we model structure that's uh, specific to both of the different observations. Okay. Um, so I'll tell you uh, about one project that's been ongoing for a little while now, but uh, I think it's super exciting and a, and a really cool example of uh, canonical correlation analysis. Um, so what we did was we went to uh, images uh, of the particular samples that we had. And I should say that this is, uh, uh, this is all from uh, TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas. Uh, these, these are pathology images uh, of the samples that are subsequently genotyped. Uh, we also have all the pathology images from GTEx. Uh, they're not publicly available yet, but at the minute they are, uh, we will download those and run those as well. So what we do is we take each of these pathology images associated with a particular sample. Uh, we did something very naive here, which was took 
uh, 128 SIFT features uh, for each image. We're actually thinking, that we, we've actually done uh, different things subsequently where we actually use uh, variational autoencoders to pull out uh, the features, the image features uh, that may or may not be represented uh, in the gene expression data. And then our second observation matrix is actually a uh, uh, gene expression levels from that exact same sample, okay? So uh, there, I don't have the, the beautiful results uh, of uh, the differential images, but what we can do then is uh, in, in this, uh, in, in this uh, uh, canonical correlation analysis model that we fit, so here Y1 is going to be the images or the image features and Y2 is going to be gene expression levels from the exact same sample. Uh, so then when we look at, at lambda 1 and lambda 2, we're going to get essentially uh, a, uh, an ordering of a particular set of images uh, that correspond to uh, relationships uh, among a specific set of, of genes, okay? So what are those genes that we pull out? So when we look at the go terms associated uh, with uh, different matrices, uh, sorry, different images, uh, we see something kind of phenomenal. And I, and I really hate these go analyses generally. I feel like they're not interpretable, but this was just one of those situations where it was immediately interpretable, so we got really excited about it. Uh, so, for example, um, you can see uh, extracellular matrix organization on here, which obviously has to do uh, with uh, how these pathology images uh, are, are, uh, are organized uh, in terms of the cells in the images. Uh, and, and actually, you can uh, see very clearly along specific gradients. So if you, if you uh, plot the most extreme examples uh, of the images, you can see, you know, for example, uh, very uh, short round uh, cells versus long skinny cells. Uh, and you can pull out the exact set of genes uh, that are differential uh, across that set of, uh, uh, set of images. Uh, and again, this is in incredibly uh, uh, important in terms of uh, actually the, the, uh, uh, the pathology images, the, the organization of the cells, thinking about yeah, nuclear division, uh, extracellular matrix, skeletal system development, uh, all of these uh, yeah, signaling pathways, uh, cardiovascular system development, cell adhesion, uh, these are surprisingly interpretable, which again, I wasn't really uh, expecting, but we found. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me just conclude now. Uh, so we, think we, we have discussed today exploratory data analysis, uh, thinking about uh, the highly structured models uh, in order to be able to interpret uh, data that is very, very high dimensional, that has a small number of samples, but a huge number of features. Uh, so yesterday we looked at uh, latent population structure. We can also look at sources of gene covariation. Uh, think about gene co-expression networks uh, and getting these uh, regularized covariance matrices from these models uh, and actually using them uh, to find expression QTLs or said conversely, uh, uh, using expression QTLs to be able to validate uh, specific edges in our network. Uh, there is a ton of work uh, that my group is uh, thinking about right now with respect to these ideas, including uh, thinking about statistical models to scale uh, and robustify the results. So uh, something that I haven't told you and actually swept under the rug uh, a huge amount is uh, how we actually uh, run these models, how we actually fit them to data. And the problem is because we're talking about such a low per, uh, proportion of variance explained by uh, most of the factors, most of the very sparse factors in the model, what we actually do is we run it, uh, uh, fit these models a thousand times using variational expectation maximization uh, from a thousand different random starting points. And we actually build a thousand different networks. Okay, so if we have a, a tissue, network, uh, tissue net network for skin, we actually build a thousand of them, one from each run, okay? and uh, we vote on the edges. So we basically do uh, a bagging approach where every single edge is voted on. And if uh, the edges go above a specific threshold, uh, we include it in the network. Uh, and uh, that will make a lot of you nervous, but uh, it's really the, uh, the only way we could get uh, these robust networks. And what's reassuring to me is that, first of all, we can validate the network edges. And second of all, that the components that we find, the networks that we find are almost entirely fully connected, or not, not fully connected, but well connected. In other words, uh, there's not going to be three different disjoint networks. Um, I mean, uh, so uh, I'm happy to hear alternatives to that, but uh, that was really our, uh, our poor man's way of doing it properly. Um, okay, uh, thinking about how to incorporate prior knowledge uh, into the model, obviously this would definitely help with uh, robustifying the results. Uh, evaluating the statistical significance. So uh, again, I think something that uh, my group is very interested in, and actually uh, Greg, whether he knows it or not, is uh, going to work on this with uh, uh, one of our colleagues at Columbia. Uh, but uh, uh, thinking about how, again, we, we can evaluate uh, the, the statistical significance of the latent, uh, the, the latent structure that we're identifying uh, 
uh, with respect to some null hypothesis, where we have to be very careful about how we define the null hypothesis uh, in light of the heavy priors that we're using for regularization. Uh, thinking about how to actually evaluate statistical power. So what is our statistical power uh, to recover specific edges for tissue-specific tissue networks? Um, we need to actually do that, that simulation very carefully. Uh, and obviously, uh, for everything that I'm talking about, whether it's the pathology images in CCA or uh, just these uh, uh, much simpler uh, uh, linear models, uh, how do we uh, ex extend them to uh, m more complex data? So how do we incorporate cis-regulatory elements, uh, different phenotypes, uh, binary data, uh, multi-class data? Uh, all of that would be interesting given the uh, really exciting uh, data sets we have coming down the pipeline now. And actually one that is, uh, I'm particularly interested is actually time series data, where you end up having um, a tensor as opposed to a simple matrix. Uh, you have observations across time. Uh, and now you can actually think about how to structure the relationship uh, of, of these patterns across time. Okay, so with that I will conclude, and I should say uh, uh, this, uh, this paper here describing the uh, canonical correlation analysis is uh, it's on archive, but uh, it's going to be at JMLR in a little bit. Uh, and this one came out uh, in PLOS Comp Bio like a week and a half ago, uh, if you want to look at it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. The last thing you said then with the time series and the tensor, would, when you're thinking about taking into account the ordering of those points that you get in the time series, or would it be interchangeable? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, I mean, right now, in terms of just tensor decomposition, uh, unless you put a specific prior on it to uh, sort of a Markovian prior, right, it would be uh, independent. But I, I think I'd be very interested in the case where we have some kind of Gaussian process or something uh, connecting the, the, the time series in a smooth way, yeah. So actually we're working on that, uh, not only in the context of gene expression data, uh, where we have very few time points. So we sort of have to put time series in quotes when we have three time points in gene expression data that's not really a time series. Uh, we're actually building these models in the context of fMRI data where there's a huge number of time points in the time series. So uh, there's also probably a lot more stationarity there than in gene expression data when we think about uh, getting time series responses to particular stimulus. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, so what we do the association test